right, we are here and we are live. This is one of those days where I was just really, really down to the wire. And the reason is the first story that we're going to do, and we're going to into in, in just a couple of minutes, is about the Biden administration's measures to stop chip manufacturing from going, or chips and stuff that's used in chip manufacturing from going to China. And I think that is actually a really, really big story. And the only stuff I could find on it in terms of videos was like financial news stuff talking about how the prices of tech stocks have gone down. And while that's, you know, newsworthy, I think the story is much, much more than that. And that's all I could find. And I spent a lot of time looking for something really, really good. And that's how I, lot, I spent a lot of my time <laughs> today in preparing for the show was trying to get something really, really good on that first story. And I think it says a lot that I had a lot of trouble finding it. And I think what it says is just the mainstream media doesn't see this as a sexy story. It's, we're talking about a chip embargo and they just don't seem to think that it is something that's going to get a lot of viewers. It's not because it's not important. It is actually very important. But before we get to that, I really want to look at uh, a lot of the comments that we got here. Matt the Man is on and he says, Evening Laurel Nation. Thanks, Matt, for going out and feeding the rabbit and picking up the eggs. I just, I was totally out of time. I was trying to feed, I was trying to feed my man and, um, I may have spent a little too much time on that today instead of the other stuff that I need to do, but the food was good. The food was good, so it was really worth it. We had quiche for breakfast, we had shepherd's pie for lunch, and then for dinner, ham, green beans, and sweet potatoes, and they were fucking delicious. Big Scary Steve says, Hi, Laurel. I've joined the club. I got my first ban on YouTube this week for supposed hate speech. You have to tell me what it was. Don't repeat what you said, though. Just give me an idea, because if you repeat it, I could get in trouble on YouTube because you wrote something. Um, I do have my uh, Rumble channel on here and let me post it for everybody. I like to post the Rumble stuff for everybody in case I do get kicked off of YouTube temporarily or permanently. You know where to go to pick up the show. And Mary says, food sounds yummy. It was. It was good. Over here on Entropy, Elva Caro says, I have to see if Rumble would even allow it. You're talking about your, your video, your cartel video just cleared 10,000 views. So uh, Elva Caro had sent me a link to that cartel video. It's about cartel violence. Apparently sometimes they videotape themselves doing things to people and send it to the families to try to get um, the ransom money. I, I don't need to watch this. I, Elva Caro sent me the link and I appreciate it and appreciate the work that went into it, but I know I just don't have the stomach to watch that. You guys are welcome to watch it, but um, I just, I know that that stuff happens and I don't, I don't feel the need to watch it. I don't feel the need to watch it. Alkman says, Biden won't talk about the chips. Too many ice cream questions to answer. Oh, I was reading Elva Caro's message. I'd have to see if Rumble would even allow it. The cartel video, it's the video Matt always talks about being the most horrific gore he's ever seen. And I edited it to make it easier to watch than the full videos. Again, I know that stuff happens. I have read about, I've read descriptions. I don't need to look at it. Matt wants me to look at it. Matt wants, wants me to look at it as a way of preparing myself for what's to come so that I'm sort of steeled against it uh, when the country erupts into that sort of thing. And my thought is, I, um, I, I just, I don't feel the need to watch it. We will deal with it when it happens. And I understand that may me, make me a little less emotionally prepared, but stuff like that haunts me. And I don't need to have those nightmares and visions. I don't need to be thinking about it involuntarily now. So I don't need to watch it right now. Big Scary Steve says that what got him silenced by YouTube was he disputed the reality of non-binary people. You crazy person. You crazy person. Black Magic posted on Rumble. He says, I am still alive. 
Good. I actually talked to Black Magic the other night because we are, for my son's cabin, we are putting in a little wood stove and we wanted to ask um, Black Magic some questions. Matt and I were disagreeing on what kind of wood we could put in there and how big it needed to be, etc. So I said, let's just, let's just call Black Magic. And he's like, okay. <laughs> so we did. And he was gracious enough to talk to us about it for a while. Okay, let's go ahead and um, jump into this first story that I alluded to earlier. By the way, some people, uh, I have in the past gotten people saying, stop with the chit chat at the beginning. It's a minority of people. Stop with the chit chat at the beginning, just jump right into the stories. I think it's really common on most channels, unless it's really short. If you got like a 10 minute video, then yeah, just jump right in. But I think it's really common on most channels to start with a little conversation. To welcome everybody because this is a community so we want that community feel and also to give people a chance to arrive and um, heat up their food get a drink sit down get comfortable and just kind of ease into it but now we have eased into it so let us discuss it the biden administration has just issued an order restricting chips going into china now I was a little so I was a little confused at first because I was like, "Don't we get them from China? So how are we doing an embargo on them going there?" So I read more into it, and I mean, do we get our chips from China? That's actually a very political question because we get them from Taiwan. So China would say, "Yes, you do," but Taiwan would say, "No, you don't." We get most of our chips from Taiwan. We get like over 80% um, from Taiwan, not that many from China. China imports the chips, but they use the chips to make all of their electronics that we buy from them. So they, they get most of their chips from Taiwan. And there is a concern about if China were to take over Taiwan, then we really would have a chip shortage because that's where we get most of them. And we've been having a chip shortage already because of supply chain disruption and trouble getting stuff out of Taiwan just because of all the supply chain stuff. But it's not because the chips were coming from mainland China. They weren't. But this is, this is a very, very big deal. This embargo on chips going to China is destroying their tech industry. Now, their tech industry has already had some very serious blows in the past couple of years because of their zero COVID policy and they're constantly shutting everything down. So this hurts it even more. It is now very difficult for China if they can't get the chips to manufacture anything, any kind of electronics, not only to sell on the global market, but it also makes it tough for them to make stuff for themselves. It makes it tough for them to make their own, uh, their own uh, military technology if they don't have the chips. So not only can they not get the chips, they can't get the equi equipment that's used to make the chips. Because even though a lot of the chips are made in Taiwan, the Taiwanese are using American chip making equipment so like we make the equipment send it to them and they press the buttons to make it's probably more complicated than that but we give them the plans we tell them how to do it then they do it but a lot of the planning a lot of the creativity the technological creativity the scientific advancement is in fact coming from the united states and then it sold um, like the the companies arrange for everything to be done in in taiwan because it's cheaper but a lot of the thought process uh, is still happening in the u.s thank god thank god something's happening here uh in terms of industry and um and financial advancement Okay, so this is an article, America, this is one of the few more comprehensive articles that I could find. Most of them, as I said, were all about how, oh, my stocks have gone down. You know, again, that is significant. If the stock market crashes, that's a very, very big deal, both in terms of the economy, but also global financial stability and global political stability. But this is, this is more than your stocks going down. America's once unthinkable chip export restrictions will hobble China's semiconductor ambitions. 
This is from just a couple of days ago. It says October 11th, so five days ago. Key points. The, the U.S. Department of Commerce introduced sweeping rules aimed at cutting China off from obtaining or manufacturing key chips and components for supercomputers. Analysts say that this is likely to hobble China's domestic chip industry. So even though most of the ones that we get, we get from Taiwan, they do make them their own for themselves. They get some from Taiwan, but they also make their own. But they can't without the chip making equipment that they get from us. Washington's export rules could touch other parts of the supply chain that use American technology, highlighting the wide ranging nature of the latest restrictions. China's ambitions to boost its domestic chip industry has likely become magnitudes more difficult and costly after the U.S. launched some of its most wide-ranging export controls related to technology against Beijing. On Friday, the U.S. Department of Commerce, this is last Friday, um, introduced, not a couple days ago, but a little over a week ago, introduced sweeping rules aimed at cutting China off from obtaining or manufacturing key chips and components for supercomputers in what is seen as a huge escalation in tensions between Beijing and Washington in the technology sphere. This is a huge escalation in the conflict between the warm but not hot kinetic conflict between the U.S. and China. This is a major attack, if you will, on their economy and on their ability to make their own military equipment and other things that they need for themselves. They are not just going to sit down and take it. They, they are going to retaliate in some way, not necessarily by like bombing us or something, but they're probably going to be introducing some sort of economic restrictions. And this does increase the chances that there will be a kinetic conflict. This does increase the chances if they can't get their chips and they need their chips. It increases the chances of them going after Taiwan where so many chips are made. They can, if they may want to try to get the chip industry that's currently in Taiwan. They already want in Taiwan, but this increases the urgency of them going after Taiwan. Back to the article, America argues that such advanced semiconductors can be used by China for advanced military capabilities. Okay, yes, and I think that that's probably part of it, but personally, I think this is a way to attack their economy. I think the U.S. is, um, U.S. government is getting very concerned about China and wants to try to go after it in ways that fall short of all in out war. Although that this may lead to that. So I don't think this is just about them using it to make weapons. I think they are trying to, the, U, the Biden administration is trying to damage China's financial stability. Quote, there is no going back to the way things were. This is from Abishir Prakash, co-founder of the Center for Innovating the Future and advisory firm. With the last action, the chasm between the U.S. and China has now expanded to the point of no return. Here are some of the highlights of the new rules. One, companies require licenses to export high-performance chips, usually designed, excuse me, usually designed for artis, artificial intelligence applications to China. Number two, even foreign-made chips related to AI and supercomputing that use American tools and software in the design and manufacturing process will require a license to be exported to China. So that's how they go after a lot of the stuff in Taiwan. They're sort of saying, if your chips are made with our technology, we don't want you to export any of those to China. Now, Taiwan may say it's our decision. We're a sovereign nation, although China disputes it. Um, but I think right now, Taiwan doesn't want to piss off the U.S. because it is in a very precarious position. So they're probably going to do what the U.S. wants. And then also there's the threat of we'll stop sending you the American tools or software. I mean, they already have a lot of them, but technology is always increasing. It's probably more Taiwan's just going to comply because they are at the moment dependent on American protection or at least the, the uh, uh, impression 
what's what's a perspective what's not what I, the way it looks the way it um perceived perceived american protection u.s number three u.s companies will be heavily restricted in exporting machinery to chinese companies that are manufacturing chips of a certain sophistication Quote, the latest chip rules are a sign that Washington is not trying to rebuild relations with uh, with Beijing. No, they're not. I, I don't I, I don't think we can. I think we're beyond that. Instead, the U.S. is making it clear that it's taking this competition more seriously than it ever has and is willing to take steps that were once unthinkable. What impact will U.S. restrictions have on China? Semiconductors are some of the most important technology products. They go into everything from smartphones to cars and refrigerators, but they're also seen as key to military applications and advancing artificial intelligence. We still produce, American companies still produce a lot of stuff in China that requires these chips. So this is going to make it very, very difficult for companies to keep outsourcing stuff to China. And I think that's part of the plan. Long term, that makes a lot of sense, but if you do this too fast, it really should have been done long term starting a long time ago. If you do it too quickly, you're gonna cause a, a crash. Now, the uh, Biden administration might not have a choice. They might see, okay, war is imminent. We're going to have to take rapid action, even if it does cause a crash. But I think um, I think that's likely to happen because it's it's happening so fast. I think this is going to really crash the economic markets. They may have been doomed anyway. They probably were. So, but this will speed things along. It's an, it's another nail in the coffin. This is for sure a major escalation in the tensions between the U.S. and China. And it will also make a lot of your electronics more expensive and harder to get. So just be thinking about that over the next couple of months. Right now, a lot of places have inventory, and we'll talk more about the bullwhip effect later on and um, everything coming up for Christmas. But if you think, and I've been saying this for a few years now because it's been true for a few years and it continues to be true. If you are think. Uh, are you, if you are thinking that you need to replace some major piece of electronics or even a minor piece of electronics in the next couple of years, you might want to get on that. If your refrigerator is on its last legs, go ahead <clears throat> and do that. All right, let's look at one. Uh, one of the companies that's really screwed by this is Apple. They still make most of their iPhones in China. Let's look at a couple of the comments. Oxford 3006 says society was fine without chips. We need to stop relying on them. I think that's true for a lot of things. But uh, and in fact, Matt and I have been working towards being less reliant on a lot of stuff. Um, we are trying to make everything as self-contained as possible. It's not something that you can really do overnight. This is definitely a process that takes several years, which is why I've been telling people for a while you need to get started in homesteading. You need to get started in prepping. The best preppers are homesteaders because ideally you should be living your life so that if everything around you stopped, you would hardly notice. You would still notice because you would hear screaming in the distance. And there's always going to be stuff that you trade for. For thousands of years, people have not been 100% uh, self-reliant they trade for things usually luxuries like coffee you don't have to have coffee but you trade for things like that so you would still even if you were a homesteader you're still gonna go out and buy some stuff the modern version of trading um, but most of the stuff that you really need you should have because we are way too reliant not just on chips and not just on electricity we're way too reliant on electricity we're way too reliant on society at large, the global supply chain, we're too reliant on it functioning well. Not just functioning, but functioning well. There has been a very extended period of peace where supply chains were not being disrupted and it was you were able to get stuff a lot cheaper because companies were outsourcing stuff overseas and it made everything a lot cheaper and easier to get but when you start introducing international conflicts like we're having now that breaks down we start we really saw it during covid 
and that's going to continue and it's going to get worse. FYI, uh, looking more at more of the comments, rational wrong thing says, learn how to refrigerate without electricity Two peeps. It's fairly easy. I don't know that refrigerating without electricity is very easy, but learn to preserve your food without electricity. It takes practice. There's a lot of skills that have kind of gone by the wayside for the average person because it's just so easy to refrigerate and freeze a lot of stuff. Um, but preserving food without a freezer, you need to learn how to, canning is a big one. Canning is a big one, dehydrating. Freeze drying, you would have to do while there is electricity. You really can't freeze dry. It would, at least it would be very difficult if there weren't electricity. Um, but there's a number of other methods, uh, fermenting, pickling, all of those things. You need to learn how to do those. Let's look over here at Entropy. James McDaniel says, oh, he's talking about Alkman. Elva Carroll, looking at finance, I think we're going to get out of this in a better state than I would have thought even five years ago. The Fed is destroying the ECB and that capital is going to come here. Uh, I think we're going to exper experience a global catastrophe and then in 10 or 20 years, I think things will be better. I think eventually everything will recover, but it's going to be a rough, very, very rough ride to put it mildly. So I do think when we get to the other side, and I have to be optimistic, could things be worse? Sure. A anytime you throw, you know, everything into chaos, you could end up with something worse, but I'm going to be optimistic and say it's going to be better at the other side, but it's going to be, it's going to be very, very rough until then. Alan Harry says, cut the chit chat. This is your channel, so do what you want. Yeah, I know that's always been an issue. Uh, well, I want feedback from people because some people have really good suggestions. They make suggestions and I'm like, huh, that's a good idea. I think I'll try that. So I don't want to discourage people from making suggestions or even saying, you tried this and I got to say it didn't really work. So um, I, I don't want to tell people I never want any kind of feedback. I do, but I, I am in the end going to make my own decisions on, on um, how to run things. Altman says, Japan's desperation for fuel after, after FDR placed an embargo on them led to war. Chips are just as critical to society now. Yes, Altman is right. And there was a video, I forget who did it. Was it redacted or someone else? Matt knows. Matt, Matt can put it in the chat that somebody else. Actually, that's what brought it to my attention. Matt sent it to me. Oh, it's on my phone, actually. Matt sent me the video and it was somebody saying how important that was. See, now my light just came on. I think it's because I touched it. Elvico says, oh, this dec decade is going to suck. Yes, it already does. It already sucks. It's going to get a lot worse. I am confident in the world's ability to get worse than it is now. Easy's, easy Infidel says, things will settle down after six months. Six months after the collapse? I know you don't mean six months from now. <laughs> It, yeah, it's not going to settle down six months from now. I think um, if things don't happen between now and, and then, at the very least, things will very much fall to pieces in the next presidential election. I think things will really go to hell at that point if they haven't gotten gone to hell before then. I... Uh, Okay, I'm good. Well, Rational Wrong Think is saying the way to make a refrigerator, not a freezer, is with evaporative cooling, wet canvas box. Um, I think that probably works well in places that are very dry. I once got an evaporator, evaporative cooling fan when I was in Philadelphia, and it absolutely did not work. I, the fan worked, but everybody told me, I was like, why doesn't it work? All the reviews from these people in Arizona say it works great. And it was explained to me it's because it works on evaporative cooling and I was in a very humid location. If you're in a very dry location, it, it works great. Okay. Let us look. Uh, let's move on to the next story, which is the president. It's still, it's still hard for me to say President Biden. That's just, it's just hard for me. The president is now threatening, oh snap, I have to fix something, hang on. 
is now threatening Saudi Arabia. Hang on a second. I forgot to fix something. And that's the wrong thing to do. This is the right one. Oh, there we go. Duct tape production. Okay, so the president thinks that he can threaten Saudi Arabia. He's making enemies when we don't need to be making enemies. Are the people, or the really the rule, it's not the people that we're dealing with, it's the ruling family of Saudi Arabia. Are they good people? No. Are they, uh, do they live up to Western standards or Christian standards of, of how to behave? No. They do a lot of things we don't like, but we kind of need them because right now we need the oil and they are one of the three major global oil producers. So sometimes in diplomacy, you do what you got to do and you shake hands with people you need to shake hands with to do what's best for your country. They run their country. We win ours. We'll make whatever deals we need to make with them as long as it's to our benefit. That should be our attitude. Um, Saudi Arabia did something that Biden didn't like, and he thinks that he can threaten them into submission. I don't think he can, because Russia and China are all too willing to welcome them with open arms if they decide to walk away from relations with the U.S. I think the Biden administration needs to uh, be a little more humble in foreign dealings. Tensions between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia escalating sharply this week, with U.S. officials accusing the Saudis of strong-arming OPEC into cutting oil production and helping Russia maintain its war machine in Ukraine. The Saudis have conveyed to us, both privately uh, as well as publicly, um, their intention to reduce oil production, uh, which they knew would increase Russian revenues and potentially blunt the effectiveness uh, of sanctions. We made clear that that would be the wrong direction. The OPEC Plus decision to cut oil production by as much as 2 million barrels per day has rattled the White House, which now says it is reevaluating its relationship with the Saudis, one of the U.S.'s most important Middle East allies, just months after President Biden traveled to Jeddah in an effort to mend an already faltering relationship. I am uh, in the process when the, when the uh, uh, this House and Senate gets back, there's, they're going to have to, uh, there's going to be some consequences for what they've done with Russia. Multiple sources <coughs> also telling CNN that other OPEC plus members, including the United Arab Emirates and Iraq, oppose the Saudi-led decision. Those countries have now indicated to the U.S. that they may not move forward with the kind of huge cuts that Saudi Arabia wants, one of the sources said. The Saudis have pushed back against the Biden administration, releasing a rare written statement accusing the U.S. of trying to distort the facts and insisting the decision was based purely on economic considerations. Saudi Arabia is uh, not siding with Russia. Saudi, Saudi Arabia is taking the side of trying to ensure the stability of the oil markets. As the Biden administration considers how to punish Saudi Arabia, a senior official tells CNN they've been purposefully vague to keep the Saudis guessing. But one option lawmakers are considering is to ban future weapon sales to the country once Congress is back in session. I think it's unlikely that we will support any additional arms sales to the Saudis. <coughs> this was a punch in the gut. There are currently no imminent weapon sales to Saudi Arabia in the pipeline, though, and experts are skeptical that the relationship will fundamentally change. Because of Saudi Arabia's activities in the war in Yemen and the civilian casualties they caused, followed by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. Okay, nobody cares about Yemen. Nobody cares about Khashoggi. Like, the vast majority of Americans, I'm mean like 99%, would not be able to find Yemen on a map. Even if it's labeled, they'll be looking all over, you know, they'll be looking in South America or whatever. Nobody cares about Yemen. Nobody cares about Khashoggi. Uh, Congress has become more and more critical uh, and controlling of U.S. foreign military sales to Saudi Arabia. There's very little coercion left uh, that the U.S. can do uh, in trying to control uh, military sales to Saudi Arabia. Yeah. So uh, I think Saudi Arabia is going to do what Saudi Arabia wants to do because they have other people that they can go to. They have other nations that they can buy weapons from. They can buy weapons from China or, or Russia. They don't have to come to us. So if they want to make more oil, they can make more oil or less oil, I guess. They were cutting it down. 
that is why I, it's like our all of our our oil our gasoline prices have been going up i expect they will continue to go up and as a very important side note to this story maybe not a side note but a a, um, a related story was the biden administration is said to have tried to strong arm saudi arabia into just waiting one month before they cut oil production just wait one month why one month well then the election will be over the midterm elections so it's not about trying to help the united states which is what the biden administration should be doing they should be doing what's best for the country and for the people who elected them to office it's about doing what's best for their party and staying in power and that was a quid pro quo uh, telling Saudi Arabia that they're going to suffer all these consequences unless they wait until the elections are over. So we will see if anything comes from that. Adam Scott, no relation, says, wasn't Saudi Arabia involved somehow in 9-11? Yes, because Osama bin Laden was from Saudi Arabia. Maybe time to deal some justice. No, I just... I. Uh, deal with the other co countries based on what we need from them let's let's make deals uh let's do what's best for us and recognize that they're doing the same that they don't owe some sort of loyalty to us and they're going to act in their best interest and we should be trying to find a deal that works best for everybody you start pissing them off they're not going to want to deal with you and why why do you need to piss them off this should just be business. This should be all about business and not uh, some sort of loyalty that we think they owe us. Why would they owe us loyalty? Mark Alfrey, Alfrey, am I saying it right? Mark Alfrey says, turn American oil back on. Totally agree. Tazzy, Brandon shit talks the Saudis, then asks them to help him out. <laughs> and then he can't understand why they shafted up. Totally, 100%. I wish I could like that comment. I'm not sure I can. Reason it says, imagine if we hadn't gotten into a proxy war with Russia, or if we hadn't shut down Keystone. How is Keystone not being talked about after this? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, Leadpilled says, what happens when OPEC stops using the U.S. dollar over this? Yes, very likely. And I've talked about that. Yep. Um... Tank Ace says, New World Order stuff, World Economic Forum, you will own nothing. We're getting there. We are getting there. Over here on Rumble, uh, Graham Godfrey says, and best looking, talking about Black Magic. Black Magic says, China is going to be able to buy it, reverse engineer it, and produce it without acknowledging copyright law. Can China reverse engineer it? I wonder. It seems like the Chinese have to copy the rest of us an awful lot. Why can't they just come up with their own ideas? They may be very good at manufacturing. They may be very good at a number of stuff. Supposedly their IQ scores are very high, but I haven't seen a whole hell of a lot of creativity from them. So can they reverse engineer it? If it requires creativity, Maybe not. They'll probably pay somebody else in another country a lot of money to reverse engineer it. Maybe they'll go over to the Russians. The Russians, they could probably reverse engineer it. Uh, Tom Tom says, Biden is also trying to push the Kiev government to retake Kyrgyzstan from the Russians in time for the midterms. That won't help the Dems. Yeah, I think this is going to be a red wave. For a little while, you know, this is why Biden was leading on the Saudis. For a little while, when gas prices were going down, I thought, you know, the Dems might have a shot in the midterms, but now that gas prices are going back up again, what people care about most is which administration is going to put money in their pocket. It's not about luxuries. It's about being able to, to pay your expenses because inflation is getting high, very soon it's going to be about, are you going to have enough food for your family? There's a lot of families that are really struggling with that right now because food, the inflation rate for food is 13% right now. It's astronomical. Food is 13% more expensive now than it was a year ago. So that's what people care about. 
and um, gasoline going up, that's going to hit the bottom line. And people are going to vote be because of that very strongly. Alrighty. Let's move on. This is the story that I uh, made my headline for tonight's show, which is foreign saboteurs already in the U.S. ready to pose as domestic extremists. Yes. I took a little liberty from part of what Ford Observer said. So I'm going to read you the stuff from Ford Observer. This is from www.fordobserver.com. I recommend everybody go and get a subscription. I get a lot of my information from there. Matt disagrees with some of their analysis, but they do something that I can't, which is they go and they read all of the government publications. The government is constantly publishing a lot of reports and stuff. So over at Ford Observer, they have staff that goes and reads all of those reports. I don't have time to do that. And then they give the highlights. To me, that alone is worth the price of this subscription because there's a lot of good stuff in those reports, but I just, I don't have time to read those things. They give me the highlights. They give me the important stuff. But I like that. Matt doesn't like their analysis. I like their analysis. Okay, so this is some of the recent analysis. In August, we provided warning of a potential course of action from the Chinese who are preparing to launch cyber attacks during a conflict over Taiwan. A nuclear exchange with Russia is unlikely, but still possible. I agree with both of those. I think if there's a conflict with Taiwan, they're going to do simultaneous cyber attacks. Um, and I agree that a nuclear exchange with Russia possible, but I, I just... I just don't think they're going to do it. I don't think it's going to happen. It's so extreme and it could escalate to total annihilation of both countries so quickly that it's extremely risky. I, I just don't think they're going to take that kind of a risk. But this is important. This is the, the stuff that I highlighted here if you're looking at this on your screen. Both Russia and China almost certainly have special operation forces inside the United States now likely to conduct acts of sabotage against critical infrastructure during a crisis or conflict. If you go back and you watch my collapse series in the very first episode where I have the grid coming down and when I first started to write the series, I was going to have a particular group of people be responsible for it. And then I thought, you know what? It could come from either the right or the left. And then I thought, you know what? It could come from a foreign actor, a foreign government, and basically doing it knowing that if it comes from within, if the attack happens within the United States, clearly from people who are present here, most Americans will presume this is part of our domestic conflict. The left will presume that it's right-wing extremists, and the right will presume it's left-wing extremists as long as they don't get caught. Now, if they get caught, if they get busted, if they get arrested, then we'll be able to figure out what country was doing it. But if they don't get caught, which I'm sure is their plan, then the left will blame the right and the right will blame the left. It'll be presumed that it's domestic extremism and not a foreign actor. Um, and I'm sure you can envision scenarios where, of course, we'll know it's a foreign actor. I, I think it is a definite possibility that they can do it in such a way that people will think that this was domestic. It's domestic extremists. Now, uh, one of the things we've talked about, about how it is nearly impossible for an actual group of domestic extremists to pull off something that requires coordination because the FBI is watching everybody and is listening to everything and they have artificial intelligence that listens to our phone calls and is listening for certain words. And then if you say certain words or phrases, then the artificial intelligence will bring it to the attention of an actual person who then listens to it. So it's not that they've got people listening to all of our phone calls because that would just take too many man hours. They've got computers helping them so that if people start working on stuff, it's going to alert them and pretty soon they're going to figure it out. That makes it almost impossible. It'd be very, very difficult for any domestic group to actually do a coordinated attack in multiple places at once. However, a group coming from another country can lay all of their plans 
make all those decisions when they're outside of the country. Then they sneak in through the southern border, which is just open. Then all of their plans are already in place. They don't need to talk to each other. They don't need to coordinate. They're just waiting for some trigger, external trigger that, that's been agreed on in advance. And then they do what they're supposed to do. And they make it look like it was domestic extremists who somehow got under the FBI's radar. Is it possible that there could actually be domestic extremists that get under the FBI's reader? I mean, it's it's possible. I think it would be very difficult. But it's, it's possible. And if it's possible, then that means that the foreign groups would try to give the impression that that's what happened. All right, let me finish reading this. An unclassified Army facility security report from December 2020 makes an oblique reference to domestic sabotage by stating that unnamed adversaries would use, quote, conventional and unconventional means to attack the homeland. The pieces of legislation referenced above certainly reflect these possibilities and indicate that members of Congress are sufficiently concerned about the potential for catastrophic events ahead. I debated whether to show you some excerpts from the legislation, but it was a little boring. I mean, a, the legislation was talking about how, you know, we need to be prepared. We need better internal communication. We need to arrange. We need to have plans in place in case there's a catastrophe. So it was a lot of readiness legislation that we need funding and we need programs to get ready for some sort of major domestic catastrophic event is basically what the legislation was. So it looks like there's some real concern on the part of the government that saboteurs who've already made it into the country are planning something. We don't know what it is because they planned it when they were out of the country, which makes it very difficult to figure it out. Um, I think this is a real possibility. And, and so if there is kind of, if there is any attack on major critical infrastructure, don't immediately presume that it's Antifa or, uh, you know, the Oath Keepers. It, it could be China, especially if they never get caught. There's also the possibility, although I think this is less likely as possible, that um, some people in the U.S. Uh, were sort of identified by foreign governments as being sympathetic to domestic strife, wanting wanting some catastrophic event in the U.S. for their own political reasons and were brought over by either the Russians or the Chinese and say, hey, we have common interests. Would you be interested in getting some training from us and we'll help you plan and then you do it and then it's good for you and it's good for us. So that's possible as well. You could have a domestic group that's working with, for example, the Russians and then they come back from a trip abroad and no one's the wiser. So that's also a possibility. It could be a mix and match between some domestic groups and um, foreign groups. So, I mean, it could be Antifa working with China, something like that. We don't know. Um, but this is definitely a possibility that foreign actors have people already in the U.S. Um, getting uh, prepared to commit acts, major acts of sabotage. It could be the grid. It could be... Um, communication systems, the internet, it could be the banking system, there's a number of things it could be. And it doesn't have to be people who are just, uh, you know, most of the time they're in an apartment just waiting to be called up to do something. It could be people who've been put in place. This, uh, some, Especially some of these state actors have planned stuff like this for a long time. So they could have taken the time, 10 years, 20 years, and put people in place working inside a nuclear reactor so there or a, an electric grid so if you say well we have really good security for the grid there's people with the codes who work there there's people on the inside so if somebody on the inside gets in and is working for somebody else that makes it a lot harder to prevent it from happening all right let's look at the comments i'm sure there's lots of stuff <laughs> faithless Says the FBI cannot even catch pedophiles online who tell everyone they are a pedo. I don't think the will is there. It's, it's what the government wants to focus on. Yeah, the government can't go after every single person who's committing an offense. There's just, it's too much. They don't have the resources. But when there are particular things people are doing that they don't want them to do, some, something very, something that not everybody's doing. 
like you know planning planning some some tremendous act of sabotage then they're going to spend the resources going after those particular people when they really want you they will divert their resources to you all right let's look at some of the other comments rational wrong thing says if this new covid scare doesn't work it is extremely likely the new covid scare is not going to work i heard they're like oh it's mutated again like we're done and i think most people are done not just people like me who were done when it started, but people who played along for a long time, did what they were supposed to do, if you will. I think they're also done and they're not going to go for it again. Rick Bourne says, can you imagine how many sleeper cells must be in the U.S. right now after new, nearly two years of over two years of open borders? Try 20 years of open borders. I was re-watching the Chuck Norris movie Invasion USA recently and it hits home. Now, some of these people could have come in a very long time ago. A very long time ago. Yeah, AZ Infidel says two years. They've been open for the past 30 years. Yeah. Uh, Mike Bergman, I bet money there will be a false flag in the next couple weeks. The timing is too perfect. Tazzy, it's not hard to work out who is behind the stuff. All you need to check is who got made FBI <laughs> Employee of the Month. Grant Godfrey, there was a time that sharing an ACCN password, you could do things in the drafts that the AI could not read. Over on Entropy, Altman says FBI has done a crappy job of going after Antifa because they don't want to go after Antifa. For reasons we could discuss for a while, I, I think that they are content to let Antifa do what Antifa does. Um, James McDaniel says close the barn door. I think it's too late. They're already in. Tom Tom, it's almost as though governments are protecting the pedos. I don't know what you're talking about. Altman says the U.S. government have known that the Russians have put saboteurs in our country waiting for orders for longer than any of us have been alive. Yeah, I guess it's been going on for a long time. They are there. They're waiting for the orders. I think we are almost to the point where that is going to happen. All right. <laughs> Faithless says the FBI is Antifa. Well, there's your answer. There we have it. Okay. So speaking of domestic saboteurs, well, this was actually, they think this was Russian hackers. So uh, there was a cyber attack on the airports. Now, this cyber attack on the airports didn't actually affect air traffic. So they, the airplanes were never in danger. It was denial of service to people trying to log onto the airport's website. Um, I think that this was a taunt. I think this was a reminder to the U.S. government, the U.S. people, that the hackers can get in when the hackers want to get in. And it's sort of a, you know, a waving figure. Remember what we can do if we want to do it. So this is a taunt. Tonight, some of the nation's biggest airports are scrambling to protect their websites after a coordinated attack by hackers who officials tell ABC News were operating inside Russia. The first so-called denial of service attack hitting LaGuardia Airport's website at 3 a.m. this morning. Then America's busiest, Atlanta's Hartsfield, LAX, and O'Hare. More than a dozen airport websites hit with a denial of service attack, essentially jamming the websites with data. Airports have always been a target of interest for these adversaries. While no flights were affected, experts say the group claiming credit for the hits, known as KillNet, has stepped up cyber attacks on NATO allies since Russia's invasion of Ukraine <coughs> began and claimed responsibility for taking down a U.S. Congress website in July and several state government websites last week. This is the type of actor that we are very worried about carrying out a you know, destructive attack, but uh, that's not the case here. And David, airport operations were not affected, neither was ticketing, but tonight federal officials are taking these cyber attacks very seriously. Can we just take a second to admire? That is, that is a hunk of a man. That's a good looking guy, I gotta say. All right, moving on. So I don't think, I don't think they were trying to really cause any actual destruction. Same with a lot of the other attacks that they were mentioning before. It's just saying, hey, you know, people behave or we're going to, we're going to do something that actually is destructive. They want us to know. They want us to know 
that they can hack into these systems whenever they want. So there's that. Um, but it's not just the airlines that are in danger of possible hacking it doesn't even have to be hacking by a foreign actor to cripple our our transportation system our rail system as i've been covering for the past several weeks is on the verge of self-destructing because the rail industry is treating its workers like crap it's not really about money it's about time off i've shown you videos before where the workers describe having uh, working for several days straight through and staying in hotels because they're away from home and then only having 10 hours at home before they're on call again and may have to go back to work they're not getting enough time off they're not getting weekends off they're getting like one day a month off where they're not on call and they're complaining about that it's an issue of i don't want to be a slave to the real industry i can't even make a doctor's appointment because i don't have enough time off let alone take a vacation let alone see my family so that is the problem not salary they recently had a potential contract that was brokered in part by Joe Biden or his administration at the 11th hour that they tentatively said that they would they wouldn't strike because they're going to look this contract over and there's a lot of unions involved and all the unions have to vote on it separately and then once everybody's done voting then they'll decide whether or not to take the the contract it's not going well a couple of the unions have already turned down the contract. The voting's not done yet. There's other unions that are going to vote on it. But a couple of the unions have completed their voting and have voted it down. Uh, just recently, a couple of days ago, the Teamsters Union voted it down. This is from NBC News. Rail Union rejects labor deal brokered by Biden administration, raising possibility of strike. Quote, railroaders do not feel valued, said Tony Cardwell, president of the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Union. I think that's part of the Teamsters. Uh, in the article, the country's third largest freight rail workers union rejected a temporary agreement brokered by the Biden administration to avert a potentially crippling nationwide railroad strike raising the possibility that one could occur next month. Right now they're talking about possibly having the strike on November 19th. So if there's anything you need delivered by rail, get her done. Because it looks like it's very likely the railroad workers will strike on November 19th. Now, Congress could say you're not allowed to strike. Rail workers are in a special category where Congress can tell them they're not allowed to strike. But you can't, you can't force people to go to work. They'll just quit their jobs. They'll just say, screw it. We've been trying and trying and trying to get a contract. We've been giving you lots and lots of leeway here and you're not, you're not listening to us. I quit my job. And you can't stop people from quitting their jobs. And it's very likely what could happen. In a statement Monday, the Brother, Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way Employees Division of the Teamsters, so this is a division of the Teamsters Union, said 56% of its more than 11,000 workers had voted against the tentative agreement. Some of the provisions would allow workers to avoid attendance penalties for routine medical visits and hospitalizations, and the proposal included the biggest wage increase in more than four decades. Well, great, so if you have to go to the doctor or if you're in your own hospital, they're not going to penalize you. Great. It's just insane that this has to be part of the contract is we're not going to fine you for being hospitalized like that that would seem like a given not like something that they really had to negotiate for however the deal did not address the number of unpaid sick days for which workers would now be eligible among other issues that were left to be negotiated in the future Rejecting the tentative agreement sets in motion a status quo period in which the union will resume negotiations with large freight carriers. The Associated Press reported that the union will delay any strike until five days after Congress reconvenes in mid-November to allow time for additional negotiations. But right now, it's looking like they're going to strike on November 19th. This has been going on for a while. Rational Wrong Thing says, eyeball hair, that's nasty. Do I have eyeball hair? That's kind of weird. <laughs> Fa
faithless? Does anyone feel valued anymore? I feel valued by Matt. He values me. Big Scary Steve, my uncle worked for a railroad. He got crushed to death between two train cars. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, oh, here we go. Eyeball here. Lead Pilt says, I can grow hair everywhere but my head. <laughs> I just do an ear hair comb over. <laughs> Rational Wrong Thing says, valued. When did we become livestock? Uh, over here on Entropy... Everybody's talking to each other. Uh, Altman says, I think Biden was supposed to be so great for the unions. That's what their leadership said in 2020. I don't think Biden is who he used to be. Uh, was he ever a good person? I, I don't know. But I think he's not all there now. And he seemed, if you look at footage of him like 20 years ago, he's a lot more with it. So is he the same person he was in 2020? No, he's deteriorating very quickly. Uh, on, uh, what's this one? Okay, on Rumble, nobody said anything since Black Magic talked about uh, China and copyright law. All right, let's move on to the next story, which is in the United Kingdom, their bonds, bond market crashed again. Apparently, it's crashed several times, and it crashed again the other day. And the Bank of England is just trying to keep it from tanking completely. UK bond market moves are dramatic and confusing, and analysts think it could get worse. Isn't that awesome? Key points. Monday's sharpest moves were concentrated in the index-linked gilt market. Illiquid bonds were where payouts to bondholders are benchmarked in line with UK real retail price index. In a statement, the bank said dysfunction in the index-linked gilt market posed a material risk to UK financial stability. In London, UK bonds sold off again this week, pushing yields to the highest level since before the Bank of England's historic intervention to avert a pension fund collapse last month. Okay, so I did a little research on why the bond market collapses when interest rates go up. Because I thought, all right, so you get, let's say you get a thousand dollar bond and it pays you 5% per year, and then you're going to pay out, they're going to, the government's, you're buying it from the government, they're going to give you your $1,000 back in five years. Okay, and this is an oversimplified version of, of, of how bonds work. And then interest rates go up, and so the new ones that they're issuing, it's $1,000, but it's 7% interest, so you get $70 a year. Okay, so if you wanted to sell your bond, the one that's at 5% interest, you're not going to get your full $1,000 now because people are going to say, well, why would I pay you $1,000 for 5% when I can get a new one at $1,000 for 7%? So you have to sell for less. It's going to be at a discount. You're going to sell for, I don't know, 900 950 something like that. Okay, but you don't have to see. This is the part I didn't get is you don't have to sell. You can say, all right, well, I'm getting... 5%, not 7%, but I don't want to sell at a discount. I'm still going to get my same $1,000 if I just wait because I have a contract with the government. They're going to give me the full $1,000 at the end of the thing. I just have to not panic and not sell. So I'm like, why is everybody panicking? Just hold. Just don't sell. Okay. So this was the part that I was missing. There are these bond funds where a bunch of people get together and there's a fund, so if there's 100 people and then they have, basically everybody throws it, this is kind of how it works, it's not exactly how it's structured, but everybody throws their bond into the pot. So you have 100 people and each person throws one bond into the pot, now it's a common pot. So it's $100,000 of bonds. And then that price changes, or the, the new ones are issued for a higher interest rate. So if you were to sell, it, you would be selling less, and you have, as part of the structure of this fund, that people can exit. That they're allowed to sell their shares of the total pot. That's where you start running into trouble. Because you can have a couple of people who say, I don't like this, I want out, I'll take the hit. So you have a couple of people who sell, and the total fund has to, in order to pay them to cash out, they have to sell a couple of bonds at a loss, 
which lowers the total pot for everybody. So everybody's remaining shares are lower. Once you see that starting to happen, everybody panics and says, oh crap, it's going to keep getting worse. I need to get out now. So even if you understand that if you just hold on to the bond, you're going to get the full money out at the end of the five years, you say, but they're going to sell everything. They're going to sell in order to pay everybody off because people are going to start to panic. I have to get out. I don't have a choice. I have to get out. And that's how you end up with these panics and the bonds just get really, really sold off when the interest rates are increasing as they are right now because of the Fed. So that was, that was the missing piece that uh, now I understand it better. I understand why the bond market crashed when, um, because of the increasing interest rates. Okay. Back to the article. Um, Monday's did I read this already? Okay. Monday's sharpest moves were concentrated in the index-linked gilt market illiquid bonds where payouts to bondholders are benchmarked in line with the UK retail price index. The scale of the rise in bond yields, which move inversely to prices, prompted the bank to expand its emergency bond purchase program on Tuesday to include index-linked gilt until the deadline on Friday. So what the, what the government, and I guess the Bank of England is part of the government, or maybe it's you can tell me in the chat. What the Bank of England is doing is it in order to prevent the prices of the bonds from crashing, they're saying we'll buy it back at face value. So if you sell to somebody else, they're not going to give you the full thousand dollars or thousand pounds. We'll pay you the full face value. And that prevents the market from crashing. Eventually the bank will run out of money or you'll have to start printing money in a way and that increases inflation and the problem gets worse. It, it's a, it spirals out of control and that's how you get hyperinflation. Um, in a statement, the bank said dysfunction in the index linked guilt market posed a material risk to UK financial stability for the reason I just said, if they have to buy them all back, they were going to have to prevent, uh, print money, which is going to make inflation worse and it just becomes a vicious cycle. The bank's initial temporary rescue measures on September 28th were launched after warnings from liability-driven investment funds that they faced imminent collapse as a result of the capitulation in long-dated UK government bond prices. Yields cooled modestly after Tuesday's expansion to the purchase program to capture index-linked gilts, which followed a decision on Monday to increase the daily limit for gilt purchases, but remained near levels before the bank's first intervention. Analysts broadly expect volatility to continue in the coming weeks. So this is not over. This is going to keep happening, is what the analysts are saying. It has not been resolved. Analysts broadly expect volatility to continue in the coming weeks, at least until Finance Minister Kwasi Kwerteng's make or break fiscal policy announcements on October 31st. He has since been fired. And we'll get to that story in a minute. But the finance minister in the UK is no longer the finance minister. It's somebody else now. And they fired him in part because of the, of the bonds keep collapsing. Querting announced on Monday that the medium-term fiscal plan would be brought forward three weeks from its scheduled date as the Treasury looks to assuage market fears. Except his plans are out the window because he is no longer the guy in charge. We'll look at a couple of comments before I talk about him getting fired. Alkman says, UK bond market went downhill when the bond movies went woke. <laughs> Thanks for that. That was a chuckle. On uh, YouTube, Rational Wrong Think, we always talk to each other. Who is that Laurel person that people speak of sometimes? <laughs> you guys are allowed to talk to each other. It's just that when I jump into your conversations, I get really confused. I... Uh, Leadpilt says, politician was never meant to be a career. We need term limits. I don't know. I kind of feel like the people should get to decide and whoever they vote in is the people's choice. So I don't, I don't know that I necessarily agree with term limits. Um, Faithless says, I have always considered the stock market to be just gambling with businesses as collateral. Your freedom is an illusion says pulled all money out and closed bank accounts two years ago it makes a little it a little more difficult to pay bills but i was around before all this digitalness so it ain't so bad i don't feel like i can recommend that i see where you're coming from 
definitely be wary. I, I would not, I would no longer presume that all the money that you have in the bank is safe at this point. It's probably not. But having a bunch of cash in your house, I think that that's very dangerous. If anybody finds out that you have it, you then become a target for a home invasion. And be, if you're lucky, you won't be there when it happens. I, I just, I, I hesitate to tell people that that's a good idea. Again, I understand where you're coming from. I just think that it can be very dangerous to have a lot of cash in your house. Lance Corporal Veteran says, Laurel, I told my coworker he said he didn't believe the economy was getting worse. Really? Wow. No, the economy is getting really, really bad. Part of, yeah, we are going to have time to get to this. Part of, of the reason it's not worse right now is because of the bullwhip effect. Because all of the big box stores and a lot of stores, not just the big box ones, when they saw um, demand for certain things increasing during COVID because people were home and they had stimulus money and they wanted stuff to, to get them through it. And there was supply chain disruption and a lot of stores ran out. They over ordered, they kept, they for some reason thought that this was gonna keep going, that there would be further supply chain disruptions, which there have been, but they overestimated future demand and they now have a glut that is going to cause some some deflation in certain parts of the economy not in other areas uh, obviously food is one where the prices keep going up but it is masking how bad things are because some prices have gone down it when everything is averaged together and you have like, let's say 10% inflation. Well, that's because a big part of the economy, they're trying to get rid of their stuff because there's no place to store it because they over ordered and they're taking a big hit. They're taking a big financial hit. And that makes it look like the average is lower than it actually is. Because eventually those inventories will run out. And then we'll get some of the real inflation numbers. And even for food, part of this is happening with the cattle because the the ranchers couldn't feed their cattle anymore during the drought so they slaughtered their cattle which creates a temporary glut then there's extra meat available at the store the prices go down and everybody says oh everything's fine it's actually cheaper it's on sale yeah but they sold off their breeding stock so it's temporary the price is temporarily stabilized and they're as soon as they run out of that inventory they're going to skyrocket. Now, the economy is very, very bad. It's very, very bad. And all the stuff with the chips that I talked about in my first story, that's going to make it worse. And I understand why the government's doing it. I, I get it. But it is going to make the economy worse. Okay, so Liz Truss, having just <laughs> all of these bond market collapses in the UK, have caused her first of all to lose popularity a lot of people don't like her in part because of this and uh she fired her financial secretary i think as chancellor of the executor she had to fire him and um there were two major pieces that she, of the campaign promises that she ran on that she's having to just do a u-turn one of them was she said she was going to stop a tax increase for the very, very wealthy. Like the previous administration said that they were going to increase taxes on the very wealthy and increase taxes on corporations. Part of what she ran on was she was going to stop that. She wasn't going to increase the taxes on the, the wealthiest people and on the corporations. She has changed that. She's, she's reversed her policy on those two things and she ran on those things. So it's making people say, this isn't what we put you in office for and you need to step down and everything, since you took office, everything is a mess. That's what people are saying. Things are not going very well for Liz Truss right now. Now, this person that we're going to see first is her finance minister. And I have to say, you know, I have to do a little bit of, uh, of sort of uh, backtracking here when I was talking about the people that she was putting in her administration I had looked at this guy's resume and I remarked he seems like some sort of whiz kid maybe he'll do really well boy was I wrong 
I was very, very wrong about that. I was going based on his resume. It is looking like maybe he was a diversity hire and a lot of his resume is because of affirmative action. That's my guess right now. I don't know all the details, but um, he was not the whiz kid that I guess I thought that he was and I was wrong. I'm not gonna make any comment now. Can you explain to the public why you think you should remain as prime minister given you junk to key tax cuts that led you to be elected and got rid of your Chancellor. You were the one that wanted to cut the 45p rate. You and the Chancellor designed this budget together. He has to go because of the fallout from it. How come you get to stay? Former Tory Chancellor Philip Hammond has just said that you have totally trashed the Tory parties. Will you apologise to your party? Given everything that has happened, what credibility do you have to continue governing? That was brutal. That was a brutal, brutal press conference. Even as Britain struggled with a crippling cost of living crisis, the UK Chancellor, Kwasi Kwarteng, has been sacked and has been replaced with former Health and Foreign Secretary Jeremy Hunt. Spoiler, Jeremy Hunt is white. So remember how before I talked when she, when she put her cabinet together, the Prime Minister and three of her highest positions were, none of them were white men. Well, she broke down and put our white man in charge of, of, Prime of the economy. Prime Minister has been quite busy herself. She held a press conference announcing another U-turn in her government's tax cut plan. No, just this one, sir. Prime Minister, Your Majesty. Your Majesty, lovely to see you again. It's a great pleasure. <laughs> See, it, it says what he says. He says, um, King Charles back. It's so weird to say King Charles back again. Oh dear, oh dear, is what he says to her as she comes in. Thank you again. Thank you again. Oh, it's a great pleasure. Thank you again. Anyway, no. <laughs> that, that's the end of it. It's up to that. So Liz Truss, th things are not going well for her. I don't know how much longer she's going to last. She may step down in the near future. Faithless says, if only our press would do the same to Joe. Oh, I would love that. I would love that if they're like, do you have any credibility? Like, do you know what's going on, Mr. President? Do you know, do you know where you are right now? Do you know where you're here? That would be so awesome. I would love to see that. I usually don't like to see people get humiliated, but I, I'm, every now and then, I'm like, yeah, yeah, let's do it. Let, let's watch Joe Biden get humiliated. I think I might actually like it. Rational Wrong Thing says, all right, my fellow fascist deplorables, it is time for me to go. No! And lift heavy things and put them down again. <laughs> if the world doesn't end, I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye, Rational Wrong Thing. It's good to see you. Uh, Rational Wrong Thing says, trust is also a World Economic Forum-owned Muppet like uh, Boris Johnson. I don't know. <laughs> Fluffy waffles. I was called a whiz kid, but it was because I pee a lot. <laughs> Lance Corporal veteran Liz Truss's entire cabinet leaders are all diversity hires. Apparently, apparently, as I said, she she when she reversed course, she's like, okay, let's put let's put a white guy in there. So there he is. Mike Bergman humiliated swinging from lamppost potato potato on entropy. Oh, hey, I got five bucks for mandatory carry. Nine or 17 is here. Good. Hashtag keep fight. Keep fighting. Bad signal. I'll catch you on a rerun. Okay. I'm sorry. You got a bad signal. Now I'm going to have to look up what nine or 17 is because you're talking about it all the time. I had no idea. Oh, Tom, Tom says, uh, Jeremy Hunt, he may be a white guy, but he's going to be an awful chancellor. It's, I, I mean, you're in such a, if you take that job, you're in such a bad position. You're kind of in a no-win situation because the entire global economy is going in the shitter. It's kind of already there and it's going to get a lot, a lot, a lot worse. I don't know that anybody can stop it, really. And whoever is in those positions of finance minister, secretary of the treasury, federal reserve chairman, whatever, everybody who's in those positions at the moment, everything crashes because it will. They're all going to get blamed, whether it's their fault or not, because I, I really think it's too far gone. No one can save it. No one can prevent it. If you basically, if you take that job, you're an idiot because you're going to get blamed and it's obvious. It's obvious you're going to get blamed. 
Elvin Carroll says, trespassers will be shot. Survivors will be shot again. <laughs> I'm not worried about having large quantities of cash in the house because anybody worth shooting once is worth shooting twice. <laughs> oh man, I, I kind of want to put that on the door or something. Trespassers will be shot. Survivors will be shot again. <laughs> That's great. Um, Elva Kara says the Fed raising interest rates. You guys are on fire tonight. I mean, there's times when I'm on fire. You guys are on fire. Thanks for that. Elvacaro, the Fed raising interest rates is forcing the ECB to do so. This is after U.S. banks quit buying EU sovereign debt and the Fed sucked liquidity out of euro dollar, dollar market. Pigs and Germans will be at odds. I don't know what pigs, P-I-I-G-S. Okay. Yeah, it's the, no one can save it. Uh, the Fed, I... I've read a thing recently, read an article, I didn't post it for you guys, but it was the Fed is suppressing other currencies intentionally because the U.S. dollar, the U.S. petrodollar is threatened. And it's not really that the Fed is trying to go after the British pound or the Japanese yen. It's not that they're being targeted, but the Fed is trying to suppress all other currencies because the U.S. petrodollar is threatened. So I don't know whether that's true or not, but if true, then really the British pound is collateral damage. Um, and also I read that the Fed is most likely trying to increase the unemployment rate in the US because if people have less money to spend because they're out of a job, then they spend less on stuff and inflation is curtailed. So when the unemployment rate goes up, then you bring back inflation. So the Fed may actually be trying to make everybody out of a job. Elva Carroll says pigs equals Portu Portugal, Ireland, Italy, Greece, and Spain. Okay, the last article that I wanted to go over, we're actually over time, um, but the last article that I wanted to go over, I think I'll do it a little quickly, is we are still experiencing, I alluded to this earlier in the show, we are still experiencing the bullwhip effect. Uh, a lot of these stores uh, got too much inventory during COVID because they sold out of everything because a lot of people, there's certain things people bought more of because they were at home. They're like, okay, well, I'm stuck at home. We need a better TV. If we're going to be watching TV all the time and we got the stimulus money, let's get a better TV. Let's get a better couch. Let's do some home improvement projects. You know, I'm kind of feeling sad. I think I need a new outfit to make me feel better. And people had the stimulus money, so they were able to spend money. And the service industry went to hell. But a lot of the stuff people were buying, they bought more of. Stores ran out. And then they tried to get more and there is a supply chain disruption because everything was shut down. So they wanted to get as much as possible as soon as possible so that they could meet what they perceived as increasing demand, although it was temporary. I don't see how they didn't realize that, but they didn't. And um, they wanted to get stuff as soon as possible because of demand. And they wanted to get a little extra in case there was more supply chain disruption. So they went too far. And a lot of these stores got too much and now they have a glut of inventory and it's it's persisting. So you can expect, I think a lot of these stores wanted to hang on to it as much as possible until Christmas because that's their big season. You can, but they really, really want to get rid of it now. They do not want this stuff still around in January. You can expect to see tremendous sales this Christmas. Now keep in mind, for a lot of this stuff, this is it because when they got this glut, they ended all of their orders. A lot of the manufacturers they were getting it from, when the order suddenly stopped, they went out of business. So, and now we have this whole thing with the semiconductors, so stuff isn't being made. There's actually a lot of electronics that the stores like Target and Walmart have too much of right now, small electronics, like a coffee maker, something like that, which they have extra of at the moment. If you need something like that, go ahead and get it because once this glut is gone, once this inventory is cleared, it's not going to be replaced. So just keep that in mind. And I do think I maintained, I mentioned this, but I do maintain that uh, this is artificially making the inflation rate not look as bad as it is. 
I think the actual inflation is much, much worse, but this glut is actually creating deflation in the retail industry, which is taken into account in all of the averages. So the real numbers, especially when they clear out this inventory, the real numbers are going to be much, 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 much worse. And that should happen by Christmas or maybe shortly afterwards. All right. And that is a show. Let's um, just read a couple more com comments and I will close things up. Elvacara says the inventory glut is about to be good for me. I ran my phone over last weekend to an elk hunt. Oh, no, on an elk hunt. I'm sorry you ran over your phone. I just got a new phone and I'm not happy with it. I got the, I got this thing. I got the, um, the, what do you call it? The fold. I thought this would be great because I'm like, oh, well, I have a, a bigger screen. The thing is, it's actually kind of hard to hold. So I usually just use it this way. You do that and then, you know, I usually just use it like this and I'm like, well then, what's the point of having the thing? It's actually now I have a skin, a skinnier screen and it's heavier. So Matt wanted me to try to send it back, but I made the decision after the 30 days and I just haven't gotten around to it. I, I'm not sure I'm gonna send it back. It's just a pain in the ass. I got a lot too many other things going on. So anyway, I did just recently get a new phone and I'm, I'm not happy with it. It may be great for some people, but it just, it's not working. I'm not using it the way I thought I did just because it's uncomfortable. It's kind of uncomfortable to hold like this. I can't, I can't quite get it. I mean, it's just not as comfortable. So I'll close it up. Uh, okay. Let's read other stuff over here on uh, YouTube. <laughs> Rusna says LOL folding screens. Yeah, I thought it was cool, but I just, I just don't use it. Lance Corporal Veteran, my brother is still scared there might be future riots like summer of 2020, but I told him people don't have the money and time as before they'll have to be starving to do any, so anything similar without the money. Oh, it's coming. The starvation is coming. Uh, I think they'll riot. I, I'm going to disagree with you on this one. I think they will. It's, but I don't know whether that'll happen this summer or the summer of 2024, the next presidential election. We shall see. Fluffy Waffle says, went to an auto store yesterday and the shelves were sparse. Okay, well, that is interesting. But a lot of other stuff, there's a glut. There's not enough in some areas. There's too much in others. We have high inflation in some parts of the economy and deflation in other parts of the economy. Everything is kind of crazy. On that note, I think that I will sign off. I'm actually way over time because I'm trying to end at a quarter of now. But I had a really good time. I had a really good show, you guys. So uh, I... Let's watch some snow. Let's, let's see snow this time. I think I, I know you guys don't like the skiers, like the duggies, but I think I want to look at the snow. So I will see you all next week. Good night.